thank you very much. Um, it's a very special privilege for me to be here and to present on this subject uh, with Fred as, as a host, uh, the last time with Fred as a host at, at this occasion. Uh, and you'll see all across the, the, the study uh, some of the ideas that he pioneered and, and helped to establish in the international trade literature keep recurring and are a very important theme of, of, uh, of our analysis. Uh, I also want to uh, reference uh, uh, Mike Plummer and Fan Jai, who are uh, co-authors of this uh, trans-Pacific and transatlantic study. And because Mike is in Italy and uh, Fan Jai is in China, unfortunately, all three can't be here today. But it is very much uh, uh, a global uh, cooperation. Um, Doing ex ante assessment is difficult. And here are some of the main challenges that arise. Uh, of course, the template and the membership of the uh, eventual agreement are uncertain. And we have to make some assumptions about these. And we try, as, as I'll argue a little later, uh, to do the best job we can given past data. Um, other regional trade agreements, as Jeff has already uh, mentioned, that are underway in the region matter. Uh, some of them are already in place among the TPP countries. Um, finally, there are a lot of methodological concerns. Some of these involve the trade uh, simulation methodology itself. We know that in the NAFTA agreement and also in China's accession to the WTO, the ex ante modeling that was done way underestimated what actually happened, uh, the, the results, uh, the increases in trade and benefits that actually followed. And we want to uh, be able to learn from that and, and, and ideally use a better technology. Um, at the same time, there is also a danger of overestimating uh, the agreements if one does ex ante studies. The Australian Productivity Commission, for example, has argued very uh, very forcefully that studies tend to overestimate agreements in a sense to try to build a clientele for, for, for accepting them. So that too is something that we have tried to address. Now, the one thing that we have not addressed in this study are some of the mega, what I'd call mega economic effects. Uh, these, uh, Fred already referred to these as competitive liberalization. Uh, trade liberalization is contagious. Uh, if you start it in one corner of the world, in one corner of a region, chances are it will spread. The TPP has already grown from four to eight to nine to 11 countries and is likely to grow further. So trade liberalization is contagious. And we know from, if, if there is one message that really stands out from the, wor uh, from the work of the historian Angus Madison, is that during periods of trade liberalization, during periods when countries are cooperating, the world tends to grow quite rapidly. And during periods when cooperation falls apart, uh, uh, there is big trouble. So uh, these mega economic effects are not things that we can estimate, but I, I think we all have them in the back of our minds as we think about the effects of the TPP. These are the Asian and the TPP tracks. Uh, this diagram is very complicated. I won't try to go into much depth uh, in, in this discussion. And it's not complicated enough because it does not show many of the bilateral and the sub-regional agreements that already exist among the countries in this region. But in any case, one uh, very important piece of this is that in the middle are countries that are likely here in green are likely eventually to participate in both tracks. Uh, this makes this competition uh, much more benign and much less dangerous than the competition between trade blocks that economists had historically thought about in the past. The world is not bifurcating. The region, in fact, is not likely to bifurcate. Instead, what we are seeing in this pattern of, of, of uh, com uh, competitive liberalization underway. Nevertheless, this competition is, uh, is important. Uh, it's discussed a lot in the region. And it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, for example, much of the discussion in Thailand had to do over the last few months over whether it's the TPP or RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that would yield larger benefits for Thailand. Well, first of all, this is a strange question. There is no particular reason why Thailand could not be a part of both groups. 
subscribe to both sets of agreements. Um, second, it led to all kinds of, of, of uh, bad estimates, uh, and in particular, as, we, as, as I'll show later, it's likely that Thailand would benefit a lot more from the TPP than from RCEP, mainly because it already has trade agreements with most of the RCEP partner countries. So in any case, this picture sort of shows the complicated setting in which this trade agreement is emerging. And it shows why our modeling and our assessments have to pay fairly close attention to what, what already exists in the region. Um, methodology. Uh, we use a computable general equilibrium model. It has 18 sectors, 24 regions or, or countries. Uh, and it has a lot of innovations in it, in part to address some of the concerns that I mentioned in the previous slide. It has baseline projections that look ahead to 2025 when most of these agreements would eventually be fully implemented. Um, uh, and it has those projections because we know that the world economy is growing at uneven rates. So the benefits depend really on the world economy that is going to exist in the future when these, uh, when these agreements are implemented rather than that today or in the past. Uh, we model in some detail existing and future agreements. Um, we assume uh, that firms differ in productivity and that trade allows more productive firms to export and sometimes drives least productive firms out of business and that that effect uh, further raises productivity and also amplifies some of the trade effects that are observed. So this is in fact what economics has discovered over the last 10 years in the form of a very interesting literature uh, due to uh, Mellets. Uh, that, uh, that firm level differences in productivity account for a lot of the trade that we observe and explain some of the large productivity benefits that we get from trade. Um, we also model investment effects. And uh, just to sort of put a bottom line on this, some of these innovations increase the effects, but not all do. Some are more conservative, and in particular the way we address uh, estimates of what the agreements are likely to look like uh, um, uh, forecast lower uh, 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 ultimate effects or lower ultimate benefits than has been done in other studies of this sort. All of this means that this is a complicated project. Uh, we are revising it. Uh, we create new scenarios with it. For example, the RCEP scenario is new. It's not in the book that you have in front of you. Um, and all of that is reported on a website. Uh, so the website has a lot more data and is attempting to provide transparency in, into what is a very complicated picture. Um, Jeff has already discussed some of the key differences that divide countries and some of the issues that make Barber's life miserable. Uh, here, is a, here is a short list. I, uh, we discussed some of them in our book. Uh, a lot more of the discussion is in Jeff's uh, uh, and his colleagues' book. Uh, these uh, will, will be with us for some time, and they are very complicated in detail. Um, but what I would like to suggest is that it's, it's, it, one can picture these as really a contest of what kind of templates will be designed in the Asia Pacific. And, and I think Jeff was correct that it's unlikely that the template that we are now attempting to establish in the TPP is likely to uh, uh, ultimately affect trade across the whole region. But it is likely to have an influence on the template that emerges in the region. And so here is a, is a very uh, kind of high level uh, distinction between the templates that we are seeing. An Asian template that, that targets comparative advantage of Asian economies in manufacturing, attempts to bind, uh, uh, create market access and reduce barriers to manufacturing trade. And a trans-Pacific template that while also liberalizing manufacturing is aiming at sectors that are increasingly the leading sectors of advanced economies, that are the sectors of comparative advantage of advanced economies, including investment services uh, and intellectual property. So that's, that's sort of the fundamental uh, difference between what is emerging in the, on the Asia-only agreements and what is emerging in the TPP. Each of these templates produces gains. We'll actually see fairly large gains in the Asian agreements, in part because initial barriers are relatively high in Asia. So each of these uh, templates produces gains, but it's really ultimately the two together, the ability to provide uh, uh, benefits for the leading sectors of economies, both advanced and emerging, 
that generates the largest gains. Uh, here are a couple of slides on just uh, on, on an empirical uh, uh, look into what lies behind these templates. This is about tariffs. And uh, it summarizes Asian and recent Trans-Pacific agreements and what effect they have had on tariffs over the time uh, over which those agreements were implemented. In the first year, Asian agreements uh, reduced tariffs by about 20%. Uh, Trans-Pacific agreements reduced tariffs more like uh, 50%. And then eventually, both uh, achieved fairly high reductions in tariffs. But Asian agreements uh, peak out at about 90%, while Trans-Pacific agreements uh, peak out at closer to 96%. So they start quicker, they move faster, and they leave less tariffs behind, uh, Trans-Pacific agreements do, even though Asian agreements typically apply to larger initial tariffs. So if you look at tariffs alone, you would conclude Trans-Pacific agreements are stronger, but the margin is relatively small because both sets of, of agreements have done a pretty good job in reducing tariffs. The differences are much larger if you look at these regulatory issues, rulemaking issues, I think Jeff referred to them as. Uh, here we divide them into 21 groups. Uh, we use a set of databases from APEC and from the WTO to calculate mechanical scores for how good the agreements are in each of those areas. And once again, we compare Asian agreements in red with Trans-Pacific, or in this case, recent US agreements in blue. And what you see, first of all, are much larger differences with respect to rulemaking, with respect to regulatory and behind the borders barriers than you see in tariffs. And second, you see some of the expected patterns. Uh, uh, Trans-Pacific agreements are strong in services, in investment, in government procurement. Asian agreements tend to be strong in uh, tariffs uh, and related uh, manufacturing uh, barriers, and also tend to have a cluster of, of relatively strong provisions on cooperation and science and technology, some of the uh, areas uh, which are now included in the TPP, but traditionally have not been a part of American agreements. So that's, those are the differences that you see in templates. And these differences, in turn, uh, the underlying data, allow us to make some projections of what future Asian and Trans-Pacific agreements might be. And we use those, in turn, to simulate various configurations of countries that might participate in them. Um, so let me get quickly to the main simulation results. Uh, these will not surprise uh, economists. Uh, the numbers may, because the numbers are larger than we have typically calculated in such trade agreements. But the general pattern of the results should not be surprising. The better the template, the larger the gains. In other words, we will see the TPP-style template, or recent American agreement-style template, generate substantially larger gains than Asian or recent ASEAN agreements style templates. The larger the area, the more countries are included, including countries that do not already have free trade agreements in, with each other, the greater the gains. Uh, the gains are mainly from trade and investment creation and not diversion. We do see trade diversion, and I will talk about that in a second, but trade diversion effects are relatively small roughly 10 to 20 percent of the agreement, depending on what agreement we look at. Most of the benefits, 80 to 90 percent of the benefits, are from actually creating new trade among countries rather than shifting trade among, uh, uh, from uh, economies that are not part of the agreement. Uh, finally, the country gains uh, depend on trade and investment advantages, on prior patterns of, of trade. They depend on initial barriers and specifically on what free trade areas countries already participate in. Um, and um, the other point to make here, and on the level of barriers, that is countries tend to benefit from liberalizing their own economies. So the initial level of barriers has a large uh, uh, input into the size of the gains that we estimate. 
So these are the main gains. Uh, I will uh, go through some examples of how these work and then conclude uh, finally with some, uh, some country uh, analysis. Uh, the first one is the effect of the template. Uh, what I show here is actually uh, a, uh, uh, a graph for Chi the effects of various trade agreements in the Asia Pacific on China, which is not part of the TPP. It would be part of the RCEP agreement and would be ultimately part also of, of the FTAP, uh, a region-wide agreement. And what I'd like you to focus on is the very end of this graph, the, the right-hand edge of this graph. What that shows is in both cases uh, an FTAAP agreement, but in the case of the red line, it is reached with an Asian template, and in the case of the blue line, it is reached with the Trans-Pacific or TPP template. And roughly the TPP template, even for China, would predict gains in the, in the context of an FTAP, which would be about 60% larger. Now, again, remember that the Asian template is likely to be focused specifically on the comparative advantages of China and other manufacturing economies. The TPP template is likely to be focused comparative advantages of advanced economies, but it is so much more rigorous that even though it provides a smaller share of the gains to emerging economies than the Asian template would, it still provides larger absolute gains if we hold the agreement constant. So this is an example of how the template affects the, the size of the benefits. A second uh, uh, slide uh, shows the size of the benefits. And I think when one looks at this first, one gets a bit pessimistic because the TPP on the left-hand edge, particularly with its current 11 configura country configuration, generates relatively small benefits compared to other possible agreements. Um, now, mind you, the benefits are still large. There are about $100 billion a year, so it's, uh, it's, it's still not money one wants to throw away. But the benefits are relatively small because these are relatively liberal economies, and the largest among them, the largest trade bloc among them, NAFTA, already has very good trade rules generally. So that the extra benefits that one gets from the TPP in itself for these 11 countries are relatively small. But as we have discussed earlier, the implication here is to design a set of benefits, a template, that will be applied presumably to a larger group of countries. When you look at TPP 16, which would include Japan, Korea, and a couple of other Southeast Asian economies, the benefits get to be over $500 billion a year. They are similar in size to the RCEP agreement. Uh, and uh, even though uh, the TPP countries, including the United States, Canada, and Mexico, have relatively low barriers uh, to begin with. The final point of this graph is, of course, the largest agreement of them all, the 21-member FTAP, or Free Trade Agreement of the Asia-Pacific, would still generate uh, much larger benefits, and especially so for the United States and China, which need, in a sense, a global market uh, to, to fully realize their potential advantages. Uh, sector effects, um, these depend on the template again. In the TPP template, and in the uh, FTAP template, which we uh, envision as somewhere halfway between the Asian and the TPP template, services would uh, grow especially fast because service liberalization has, has lagged behind. And it's one of the areas, both through investment and through specific service sector provisions, that the negotiators are attempting to uh, focus on uh, in the case of the TPP. Um, Agriculture would do fine. Uh, manufacturing would do well, especially under RCEP, the uh, Asian agreement. Not so much relative to other sectors uh, in the TPP-16 or the FTAAP. Uh, but but uh, still, the benefits would be quite uh, broadly distributed. Um, this is a complicated graph, and I won't, don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do want to make the point that we can estimate at least one rough measure of how much adjustment would be involved in the United States during the peak period when the TPP takes effect. We think of this roughly as 2015 to 2018 as the period when the largest TPP um, 
effects would take, uh, uh, take place. And um, our estimate is that at the peak, you would get perhaps 100,000 jobs being shifted from one sector, one large sector, to another uh, during that period. Now compare that to roughly 3 million people entering and leaving the American economy every year, the American labor force every year. In other words, roughly 100,000 job changes out of a natural background flow of roughly 3 million job changes every year. So even if one looks at the peak period, the number of, the amount of adjustment, and there will be adjustment, but it will be slow, uh, small compared to all other magnitudes uh, that affect labor force adjustment in the United States. Moreover, um, the right scale shows that about two to three hundred thousand dollars worth of benefits would accrue for each job change that has to be made. In other words, the economy would gain somewhere on the order of two to three hundred thousand dollars for each job change, and that would be a sustained gain. The job change would occur one year and it would be done. The gains would be sustained uh, uh, indefinitely in the future. So adjustments are likely to be modest and they are likely to be very amply compensated by the, gains to the, by the economic gains uh, to the United States. Let me finally turn to country effects. Um, this compares uh, a TPP in the 16 country configuration, that is after Japan, Korea, and other, uh, some other Southeast Asian countries join, to the benefits that those countries could gain from RCEP, from an Asian agreement. Uh, for Japan, the benefits are about a third larger. Now, if you think about what that means, it means that joining a configuration in which America is a, a trading partner, uh, for Japan is, generates benefits about a third larger than joining a configuration in which China, which is at this point uh, uh, Japan's leading trade partner, uh, is, a, uh, is a partner. So, um, and what that has to do with is the, the depth of the agreements and their pattern across areas of comparative advantage, including, for example, Japan's high technology products. For Korea, the numbers come out differently. And the reasons that they come out differently is that Korea already has chorus. It already has the Korea-US agreement, so for it now, the priority in the short run is likely to be a free trade agreement that involves China. Uh, here, I think Jeff and I may have slightly different interpretations. I think Korea is very interested in the TPP. It wants to join, and, and hopefully it will join. but the immediate priority now that Chorus is behind them is to try to make the, the deal with, uh, with, with China stick. Uh, last, and this is an area on which there's tremendous confusion in the region, for the ASEAN economies, the benefits of joining TPP would be far greater than uh, joining RCEP, mainly because they already have uh, existing free trade agreement with most RCEP economies. The additional uh, rigor of that agreement is unlikely to uh, generate much additional benefits. It will generate some, but not uh, likely to generate much additional benefits. But access to the uh, uh, North American market and access also to the markets uh, uh, of the TPP countries, possible accumulation of rules of origin within that uh, large uh, economic entity would generate very large benefits for them. We estimate benefits would be three or four times as large as those from uh, an Asia-only agreement. Uh, finally, for the United States, uh, the picture is complicated but very interesting. Uh, the TPP and the RCEP agreements work very opposite directions for China and the United States. For the U.S., it gets nothing out of RCEP which itself is a bit surprising because it will have some diversion operating against it, but also some benefits from lower production costs uh, in Asia that come about as a result of greater efficiencies in Asia. For China, it gets uh, significant benefits from our, would get significant benefits from RCEP and some trade diversion in the case of the TPP. Uh, this is likely to be trade diversion that allows some Chinese exports to be transferred to Southeast Asia and other partners within the TPP. Uh, so on, at that 
at that level, at the level of TPP versus RCEP, uh, Chinese and American interests are competitive. And those two countries will be competing against each other to uh, sign up more members, to make the agreements work faster or better. Uh, it's part of the, uh, of the game between these very large economic uh, powers. Where their interests are very firmly and closely aligned is on trying to build a, a, a truly region-wide, and this might be actually ultimately not just region-wide, but it might also include Europe, it might be global, but a truly uh, uh, wide uh, free trade agreement, such as the Bogor goals that uh, Fred uh, uh, initially mentioned, uh, or the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, which is the most recent uh, APEC uh, formula uh, for that kind of area. There, both of these countries would find their benefits from the smaller regional agreements doubled or tripled by participating in this larger region-wide or possibly, as I mentioned, uh, global or, or uh, uh, global trading system. So what does that all come down to? I have two more slides here which repeat the previous two but do it in percentages in case somebody wants to see those. Um, what this comes down to is we are looking at two very large positive sum games and indeed it's the combination of the two, this competitive uh, process which leads to mutual progress between the two that represents the largest positive sum gains, ultimately with gains uh, reaching up to $2 trillion a year, uh, a very substantial amount of benefit from, from trade agreements. Uh, they represent uh, this process that, that, that Fred initially termed the phrase for the competitive liberalization process. First competition between the United States and China, then steadily enlargement and overlapping membership, and eventually, I would think, the economic incentives will certainly be very strong consolidation of the two agreements, a hybrid agreement as Jeff referred to it with China and the United States partners and gaining most. Each track, by the way, uh, represents a step toward that because each begins to clean up this uh, very messy noodle bowl of existing agreements, including especially, uh, I think, the, as, the, as the first uh, important piece, including rules of origin, which hopefully will be common to, to uh, all countries within uh, both agreements. Um, this argues, uh, my last slide, uh, argues for supportive policies. It argues, uh, Barbara, just do it in 2013. Uh, and uh, it argues for balancing, and, and by the way, I mean, all bets obviously are off if the membership should change yet again, and it could. It could with Korea, it could with Japan over the course of the coming year. And that would uh, justify, obviously, a much, much more complicated, longer negotiation. It argues for balancing uh, the depth of these agreements against getting them done fast and making them such that they can be expanded later to other countries. Uh, it argues, I think, for some early dialogue, maybe in APEC somewhere, that helps to envision what this consolidated uh, region-wide trading agreement might be in the future between the TPP and the Asian Tracks agreements. And it argues uh, in the last case, and this is a, a particularly important point, uh, it argues for some direct effects by the United States and China to try to address some of their, uh, try to understand and then address some of their disagreements over trade uh, with the idea eventually of, of forging cooperation that might lead uh, to a region-wide uh, block. I think there is a lot that can be done by the two. We have a, a terrific time to do that with new government in China, with uh, President Obama looking ahead to his second term. Um, and that would make this whole conversation a lot more productive and a lot more constructive toward the final goal of these mega effects of, of generating another uh, very important period in which trade liberalization drives the global economy. Thanks very much.